tales for dark nights. <laughs> Hello, listeners. This is G.M. Danielson. We want to thank you for making the first season of the Simply Scary Podcast so very successful. And we hope the beginning of our second season will unsettle you as well. We are scheduled to premiere season two of the Simply Scary podcast on January 11th, 2017. Until then, we would like to present you with this mini episode to make sure you are properly hungry for our premiere. Uh, But we have some important programming updates for you. Stay tuned after the story for these important updates to our schedule in 2017. We offer up for you a tale of life behind bars. A bloodthirsty killer is waiting for his time to pass. His record of murder surpasses those who he reveres. But the creative sentencing of the judge may be more than even he can handle. David Tyson performs Sam Marduk's Prison is Hell. Prison is Hell. Written by Sam Marduk. Performed by David Tyson. I hate it here. Granted, I deserve it. I'm currently locked down behind massive concrete walls and solid steel doors in a maximum security penitentiary. I was locked up what feels like a lifetime ago now. I earned it. I did. Every second I ride here is justice, but that doesn't change the fact that I hate it. It is cold here. I have a single concrete cotton toilet. My clothes itching are too thin to keep any chills out. The walls are gray with a sickly green tint due to the dull swamp-like tile that sends a grossly colored glow into the room reflecting the buzzing fluorescent light above me. That door is thick and unmoving. They painted the same shade of sickly green as the floor. I assume it is lead-based to save on costs. Maybe if I lick it enough times... Maybe I can kill enough brain cells to forget I'm here. I have no roommate, as many don't who are perceived as extreme risk. Thankfully, I can still have time outside and shower without being entirely supervised. More than I can say for many in here. My only commodity is my toilet paper and my journal. I earned the journal through much work and good behavior. The pencil I write with is dull and has no eraser, like that golfer we use to keep scorecards. I am allowed four hours per day with it, between breakfast and lunch. I receive the journal and pencil with my meal and return it in kind. If the pencil has any pieces missing or there are any extensive tears in the pages, then... I will lose it for the following day, so I comply. I comply so I may have some mild comfort in this concrete cage in which I slowly die. Again, I definitely earned it, but that hasn't changed the fact that prison is hell. I earned my place here because I killed people. 
I killed many people. I killed 20 people to be exact. This is the first time I've actually written it. I beat the cannibal's number, which for some reason gave me a sense of accomplishment. However, what gave me more satisfaction was the evenness of the number. 20. Two zero. Even and smooth. My composure made it this way. 21 would have made getting arrested a living hell. 15 would have been okay, but 20 was much cleaner. Increments of five. Always increments of five. Sometimes during a shopping trip, I would grab a stick of gum so as to have 20 or 10 or 30 items even. However, in the case of the killings, it was much more intense. The problem was the itch I felt in between. It was a gnawing pain in my mind from one to four to six to nine. The itch was not as bad during fives, but tens were the best. However, that number will eventually attract attention. That number is partially what got me caught, but I had to scratch the itch, so to speak. It made me emphasize with vampires and old horror stories the sensation of ache and thirst that cannot be quenched. It is nightmarish. The same remained true for my age, 40. I finished at 40, which made me content. I hated not having an even age. I could force down the bad feelings when my age ended in fives or even numbers, but I always had bad years with ones, threes, sevens, and nines. I digress. I understand it's abnormal behavior, but it's compulsion. I manage it well enough that most would never notice in a day-to-day routine. I have to reminisce on these pages because I have no way of going back. It started many years ago, and the urge only grew from there. The first time I killed was interesting. I should have felt the need to immediately kill again, as I did in later years, but I didn't. They say mental illness worsens with age. I guess that's what kept me from acting again so soon, but I'm not sure. He sat holding his side, panting in labored breaths. He didn't see me yet. From my vantage point, I could see the long white bone jutting from his leg, which told me that the pain from his ribs was worse than that of his broken leg or that he was in shock. Far above this section of the woods was a road and from what I can see, a vehicle burst through railing. A 69 Chevy C20 truck lay decimated some 40 feet below the roadway in the bush and rocks. I remember this truck because I wound up purchasing one many, many years later in a secret nostalgia for myself. Either way, the driver had pulled himself from the wreckage and crawled in agony upwards of 50 feet to the nearest tree where his strength was slowly failing him. I remember seeing a large shard of metal which had been ripped from the side of the truck and picking it up. I walked slowly to the man who reached pitifully towards me for help. I slowly shoved the sharp edge of the metal into the man's throat and watched his blood begin to spurt from the wound in his mouth. He gargled like a drowning soul on his own blood, and after a time, he ceased all movement. Forever. It was a rush which I cannot explain. The excitement of ending a human's life is next to none. I was content for a fleeing moment. I stared at the body for some time before taking a bloody shred of his pants leg that was hanging by a thread. I just wanted to have a keepsake. That was my first kill. I was never caught nor even suspected. Growing up in the mountains of the south allowed much privacy and it allowed me to get away with murder. As time grew, 
sounded the feeling of power and accomplishment. I felt like God. No one even knew I was the way I was. I would never be a suspect because I knew to hide. I hid well because I knew how to hide. From the time I was a little boy, I knew how to blend in. Sometimes it was a challenge because of my appearance, but I learned a simple skill, how to hide in plain sight. I was able to work hard in the background. I made good grades and maintained very few close friendships throughout school, so no one would ever discover anything about me. However, I made sure everyone had a nice thing to say about me. Carrying groceries, helping kids with studying, always using manners. I graduated the upper ranks of my class and soon attended the local college. After I earned a degree in business, I worked hard where I could and raised enough money to buy my own rig. I worked by riding the highways as a trucker for years and eventually bought two more rigs. By age 35, I was a respectable business owner in my town with a dispatch and a few drivers. In spite of my position, I still drove because it kept me close to my only real passion. I hit well in plain sight because white people love a black man. In a town of 90% white and 10% other, I learned to blend in despite being a minority. Learn to talk like them, learn to walk like them, and you can manipulate them into whatever you want. I hate them. Not white people, all people. My mother died shortly after I graduated high school from heart failure, and I felt liberated, for I held her opinion highly. Her opinions kept me in line and respectable. When she died, I was free to pursue my own interests. My father, while a good man in his own right, never held much weight in my actions, so I walked the path I chose for myself despite what his feelings might be. Either way, I dwindled for some time after the first murder. The urge slowly grew. By high school, I kept my eyes peeled for another opportunity to snuff out a life. Finally, that day came. The second time my murder was equally uninspiring. I found myself at a graduation party and the whole senior class was drinking heavily. All except me, that is. We were at the home of a wealthier student who had maintained a spotless record through both junior high and high school and wanted to go out in a way where she can get out of her preverbal box. I learned two things that evening. The first, that a well-mannered, well-educated lady was no different than anyone else in regards to having a darker side. She wanted to be remembered for a party. Not her good grades, not her generous deeds, not her modest manner of dress, but a party. Everyone has a dark side in some way. This was the first thing I learned. The second was that if everyone is drunk and dancing off the roof, you can bump a certain young lady discreetly enough to send her three stories down into the concrete and make it look like an accident. She landed with a smack that can only be replicated in my dreams. This was the first time I was aroused by a killing. I'm not sure why. She was in a two-piece, which I assumed her parents knew nothing about. And her skin was pale and smooth. Her deep brown hair flowed past her shoulders, and the look of utter confusion and terror on her face was priceless. Blood pulled from her head and seeped into her nearby swimming pool. You could say I fancied her, but only because she represented something that does not exist human innocence when her skull cracked against the pavement I was instantly excited 
I had to sneak away to handle it and steal a memento from the girl's room. Meanwhile, the remaining partygoers descending into madness trying to repair a situation that was far beyond broken. The chaos I had caused that night again resurfaced my deep sense of accomplishment that only comes from death. That was the second time I killed, 18 years of age. By the time I hit my stride, I stood six foot two and 260 pounds. I had always enjoyed lifting weights and working towards my overall health. A fat predator is a bad predator. I maintained that level of fitness for most of my adult life. I had to in order to pursue my passion. Of course, things would have a way of catching up with me. I was incarcerated with an unfortunate mountain of evidence. I wouldn't say I covered every base perfectly to ensure not getting caught, but I felt like I was careful enough. In hindsight, it appears I wasn't. I remember the day I was arrested. I had turned 40 at the month prior and was on the road delivering a shipment of plywood. I was behind the wheel of my rig in rural Alabama. I was taking a back road because I enjoyed the scenery and when you're the boss, you can set your own schedule. At this point, I had killed 19 and the itch was present. I would have to rub the back of my neck when I thought about it. It needed to be scratched. I needed to take care of it. That's when I saw her. Miles away from any structure or living person was a broken down baby blue Volkswagen Beetle. The emergency lights were flashing and a woman was looking into her engine compartment. The height of my truck allowed me to scan both her car and the area surrounding us. It was tall, uncooked grass and trees covered in utter blackness due to the overcast night. There was no one for miles and miles. We could be alone together. I pulled in behind her with my low lights on so as not to scare her. When I stepped out of the truck, I addressed her. Pardon me, ma'am, I said calmly. I know how to disarm. I have worked on my speaking voice for years in order to betray their security into my hands. Are you all right? She stepped out from behind her hood and I saw her in better light. She was a young Hispanic woman. Her clothes were tattered, but I think that was intentional. She had silky dark shoulder length hair and black librarian glasses. She was pretty, which was a bonus for me. Consider it like a dinner. You're going to get your meal, but when it includes dessert, then it's all the better. I also knew she could complete this cycle. She could be the 20th and I could rest. Best yet, she was petite, so there would be little fight. I think the engine is shot, she said in a desperation that these dark woods certainly play well into. She just wanted to get out of danger. Little did she know. I can give you a ride. I own my own company, so I can make time. I didn't want to sound arrogant, but I knew by making myself a manager, it would remove the creepy truck driver mentality. I don't know. I promise. I replied in my best zippity doo dah voice. I'll take you straight into town and we can find you a phone. My wife would kill me if I let a young lady stay stranded in the woods. I wasn't married, but this is yet another way of disarming someone. A spouse always makes a man less dangerous or, again, as she thought. Okay. She said, with her fear betraying her skepticism. Thank you. I'll get the door for you. As she walked to the passenger side, I held the door open for her. As she took her first step up, 
I grabbed her ankle and put her straight down with as much force as I could manage. Her jaw connected with the stud metal stairs full force. I know some of her teeth were broken by the crunch that emanated from her skull. She fell limp to the dirt as I lifted her onto my shoulder. She didn't stir long enough for me to grab a large socket wrench from my rig. I could feel the warm blood from her mouth pouring down my shoulder. I carried her into the tall grass, just out of sight, and I had my way with her. It wasn't the first time I'd made a move, but this time was special. She was the 20th. She completed the need. Halfway through, she began a wake and struggle. From there, I had to act. I took the soccer wrench and began to hit her. She struggled to scream due to her shattered jaw. I hit her in her pretty face over and over and over and over and over and over. When I had finished, I took her wallet from her jeans. Her name was Amy. I took her glasses as they fell off when her face collided with my truck and avoided the wrath of the socket wrench. They had her name engraved inside the temple. I drove off, leaving the scene entirely. I had to re-enter the highway sometime later and saw lights in my mirror. I had been stopped before, once even with a body in the back, so I wasn't worried. The officer walked to the side and called me out. You William Haverson? He asked with an unreadable demeanor. Yes, sir. And I answered coolly, holding my ID and paperwork for the truck and delivery. He then spoke into his radio. Yeah, we found him. Officer, what's this about? I began to ask, but was cut short. Sir, please turn around and place your hands behind your back. Why? I asked. I was not about to be cuffed and restrained for no good reason. He then turned me violently to my truck and slapped cuffs around my wrists. From there, he sat me on the pavement and called for backup. When other officers arrived, one finally noticed the blood on my back. Then they found the glasses. Next, they found the poorly wiped down socket wrench. They then received word of a brutal mutilation several towns over. They had stopped me initially because one of my drivers was caught with a brick of marijuana in They wanted to stop all trucks from my dispatch to make sure they were legitimate. It would be funny if it wasn't so infuriating. I was brought down on a technicality. My run lasted from 12 to 40. I was undetected for that entire time. I changed my MO. I killed strangers only. I was so careful. The technicality was the only thing that could have done this. My simple home was turned about until they found my treasure box. A shoe box of souvenirs and news clippings. From there, it was easy to pull me at every single murder. Every homeless person stabbed to death in cities. Every transistent prostitute with their head missing. Every unsupervised child near a crowded street. I was linked to them all. Now, one may ask why I'd be so stupid as to keep mementos. To that, I would say, I had to. It was my passion and the only thing that gave me meaning. I had to keep something around. They were only the memories I could have of those times. Like I first wrote, I deserved to be in prison, but... I don't regret in the slightest what I've done. The trial was grueling and irritating. Since I killed across state lines, there were arguments as to where to have my trial. In the end, it became a federal issue, which only meant more bureaucracy. My lawyer explained many of the killings would be circumstantial at best, but... Just as many now have my DNA connected to the scene and are going to be nearly impossible to deny. 
I decided to throw in the towel. The media was out for blood, the public was out for blood, and the jury was out for blood. I'd had my fill, so now it was time to pay the favor for her. There was no way to avoid a life sentence, so I might as well come clean and get regaled the tales of my exploits to a room of terrified jurors and family members burning with hatred. Despite the difficulties of finding some evidence of murders, I was still convicted for 18 of the 20. Regardless, I was punished for them all. The day of sentencing, I stood still and stoic before the judge. I could feel the eyes of all those present attempting to sear me, but failing. The judge looked down at me and rambled about my cruelties and resentment for man. The entire time he droned, I stood with the thought of that death penalty was illegal in this state. It was utterly satisfying to know the uproarious crowds were calling for my head and law wouldn't allow it. I snapped out of my revere when the judge got to the sentence. Seeing as how the death penalty is illegal in this state and in light of that limitation, I feel obligated to render as severe a punishment as is possible within our justice system and my authority. I hereby sentence you to 1,001 life sentences. He was being melodramatic. Never in history had there been such an absurd sentence. What's worse, the number was uneven, meaning that for the rest of my life, I will have to stay 1,001 when discussing my sentence. He knew this. My demeanor slightly shaken. I asked the judge, why 1,001? The courtroom was silent. The family's friends and jury looked at me with contempt, but that didn't matter then, even less now. The judge leaned over his podium. He smiled with a smugness that still boils my blood, and he calmly replied, To torment you. That's how I got where I am now. I don't interact with the other inmates or guards. I just mind my business as best I can. I don't like to think about my sentence because it makes me itch. Similar to when you haven't paid a certain bill, but you don't have the funds. It's a wincing mental discomfort. And I write the rest of this as a testament to what happened yesterday and hopes it reaches someone on the outside. My day started normally. A loud bell rang and I got to my feet. From there... My door opened and I walked to the shower facility. I tried to find myself at the end of the line so as to get the most out of my cell. I'm a man who enjoys his privacy. The inmates here are insufferable. They are uneducated criminals who would have no life outside of these walls. My fellow black inmates gave me hell for being crazy. Since African-American serial killers are considered to be such an abnormality, the other races tended to say to themselves, minus a few Aryan Brotherhood members casting an occasional slur in my direction. I entered the shower as normal, but I felt an innate sense of dread that I don't know how to describe. It just felt unpleasant. I felt watched and alone at the same time. I felt completely hopeless and near despair. I quickly finished my shower and left the facility. The halls were quiet and the stationary guard was not at his post in front of my cell. I was alone in the hallway. Suddenly, I felt a large hand grip my shoulder and order me forward. The next thing I knew... I was being escorted to the warden's office. I was somewhat stunned, but complied. I walked the tight and closed halls until I reached the last room on the rack. Inside was totally dark apart from a dim lamp illuminating the desk. The hand shoved me in and slammed the door behind me. I saw the silhouette of the warden and he beckoned me to sit. I sat across from him in uncomfortable silence. He didn't move and neither did I. 
I would force him to make the first move. After what felt like an eternity, he spoke up. Let's go over your file. His voice carried. A mild southern accent sprinkled in. I did not respond. He'd given no explanation for why I'd been called in, so I decided to buy my time. From here, I will paraphrase what was said is my memory can't perfectly recreate the entire conversation. Count one. Confess. Not convicted. Man falls off cliff and you assist him in passing. You were 12, so it wasn't included in your final file, but it warrants mentioning. Count two. Confess. Convicted. You confessed to shoving a young girl off a roof and then robbing her home of a trophy. You were 18. Count three. Confessed. Convicted. Homeless man near your college, you stabbed him and cut out a tooth. You were 20. Count four. Confessed. Not convicted. You claim to have shot a prostitute in Texas. Souvenir you took cannot link you to the crime, and she had no family. You were 24, not convicted, but you know what you did. Counts 5 through 9. Confessed. Convicted on all accounts. You killed five lot lizards before changing your M.O. That was smart. They were all strangled, and you kept a lock of hair. Left them on the highway. Count 10. Confessed. Convicted. You took a lost 12-year-old and drowned him. You kept his retainer. You were doing well in life by this point, but murder still called, didn't it? Count 11. Confessed. Convicted. Ah, this one was special, wasn't she? That gas station employee who you stalked for a while followed her home and broke in. Took your time and did it right. She broke your perfect street and you were going to make her pay, right? Kept her locket as a token of your affection. Count 12. Confessed. Convicted. Brought a man from a local nightclub in Missouri to your home. Strangled him the moment the door was closed. Chopped him up and kept his teeth. Counts 13 through 17. Confessed. Convicted on all accounts. The hitchhiker phase... It seemed like you just wanted to close the gap. You got sloppy. You left a lot of evidence behind, I guess because they were vagrants, it wouldn't have mattered. Count 18. Confessed. Convicted. You killed a housewife in Florida. You were on vacation at the time. You spotted her and just had to do something. Waited until her husband left and had yourself a good time. Another rape and strangling. You took her blood-soaked necklace. Count 19. Confessed. Convicted. You saw a jogger one morning and followed in your truck. When you knew his routine, you waited in the bushes until he passed. You killed him with a hammer and took one of his shoes. Count 20. Confessed. Convicted. That one brought you down. You couldn't resist her. You were too careless, too excited. Now you're here. You took her glasses after bashing her head in and insulting her. The worm sat back, incredulous, and took a deep breath. Do you know what they call you? He asked me. That was livid. He completely bastardized my work. And I had done so much, and he swept over it like an obituary column. I glared at him in the dark before answering. The scavenger hunter killer, the war nodded, and I hated that name. The media had dubbed me the scavenger hunter killer because my murder spanned significant distances and I collected odd, unrelatable items. My work and efforts were reduced to a joke. It still makes me sick. The warden spoke again. Are you sorry? And I sat for a moment before responding. Would it matter? No, he admitted. I suppose it wouldn't, he continued. I don't get it, really. 
You're a highly intelligent, healthy, and well-spoken man. You had a lot going for you. Why on earth would you throw it all away? I said in angrily silence. I refused to give this man the satisfaction of an answer. Do you believe in God? The warden asked. His tone changed. I chew my tongue before responding. No. Pity, he responded lackadaisically, as if my response didn't really matter. That would make what I'm about to tell you easier to understand. I waited for him to continue. Your sentence is being commuted. I raised an eyebrow in disbelief. Really? Yes. From where he sat, the warden was partially obscured by shadow, but I knew he was smirking. What does my sentence being commuted have to do with God? I realize now that I should have asked more questions, but by that point, I suppose I was a bit intrigued. I assumed he meant I should be thankful. Well, the warden said, his voice trailing off. That'll make this next part easier. You passed away this morning, son. Before I could respond, he tossed a few photos onto the table. Photos of me. There I was, covered in blood on the shower floor. From the looks of it, I had been stabbed. Yeah, the warden or who I thought was the warden continued. Some Aryan fellow wanted to prove his might by stabbing a serial killer to death in the shower. We caught him red-handed as it were. If it's any comfort to you, he'll likely be in solitary until he's got irreparable damage. And I stared at him. I stared at the photos. I simply could not accept it. This is absurd. And I said, I felt insulted at the prospect. I know it seems odd, but hear me out. The warn set up right ready to make his case. Do you know who the Universalists are? No. Well, he continued without missing a beat. Basically, their philosophy is that everyone gets into heaven, even if you aren't necessarily in their denomination. This is heaven? I scoffed. I struggled to hold back my laughter. This had to be a joke. No, see, that's the bad news, he continued. Catholics, Muslims, some Buddhists, see, they believe in a temporal plane, so they're partially correct. See, everyone does eventually move on, but before anyone can move on, they must resolve all their earthly obligations and judgments. Before I could remark... The warden caught his breath and explained further. You died this morning. You served one of your 1,001 life sentences. Welcome to number two. I stood up. This isn't funny. I'm leaving. I couldn't move. I was frozen in place, unable to use my body. My eyes felt like they were being drawn towards the seat. Please. I heard the warden command. Though his voice was much deeper now, sinking into my gut. Shit. I returned to my seat with a sensation that was new to me. Fear. No. He continued, his voice returning to normal. You're not dead. You're just starting another sentence. Everything will appear normal when you leave. When I dismiss you, you will leave here and return to your bump. Do you understand? I nodded, still stunned by it. But I then knew was true. His voice. The unexplained dread I felt that morning. I walked out of the warden's office that day, feeling a hopelessness I had never known. The prison was the same, but it wasn't. It was lonelier, darker. That feels like forever ago. I've learned since then, first lifetime does not mean from the age at which you were incarcerated. I expected a 40-year life sentence, but after speaking with the 
few other inmates who I see sparingly and who are serving sentences similar to mine, I learned that it varies and is always at least 80, but can be kept up to 120 years. It seems like the guards don't notice after a certain point. They don't run a register that we never seem to leave. It's inexplicable, but that's what's happening. Second, each go around changes you. The prisoners don't notice you. The others like you have fewer words. The guards seem always outside of the line of sight. Even when they would interact, they were like fleeting shadows. I'm cracking mentally. I'll walk into those showers and see someone shaving. Even speak with them at length. However, when I turn a corner or close a stall door, he'll be gone when I return. Next, I learned that suicide doesn't work. I learned the same way every inmate in here like me does. I slit my wrists and they just ache for a week. I swallowed bleach and had a miserable stomach ache, but no death. And I hung myself where I choked and flailed, fully conscious, for eight straight hours until a guard found me while bringing my breakfast the following morning. I learned that being murdered decreases time served, but murdering adds to it, so no one serving a life sentence attempts murder here. Finally, escaping isn't an option. On occasion, we'll have runners men who just finished their first sentence. One prisoner just snapped. He pulled it maybe 60 years before dying in his sleep. When he realized what happened, he panicked and ran. The snipers didn't even turn. He grabbed the fence and immediately fell to the ground and shook violently. He died right there of a heart attack. I saw him a week later. Third life sentence. Half crippled. It seems we're punished further if we try to leave. I don't know if it's permanent, but that particular prisoner, he was a wreck upon returning. He reminded me of the cats in my childhood neighborhood. The ones I used to torture. The first time you hurt a cat, it twitches and becomes neurotic, but given enough time, it accepts its fate. The man now spends his days staring silently behind dead eyes at whatever light source is around. Some even consider this some sort of limbo, where we remain trapped in a prison in which we were condemned until our body and soul have finished their sentences. Others see it as some kind of purgatory where we are all groomed for eternity in paradise. Either way, we are forced to remain, forced to live until we pay our dues, never truly die. I don't even know if time is the same now, but if you're hearing this, I managed to successfully get the word out. I have a handful of plans which I cannot speak of on record. I cannot risk any further attempts should this fail. I'm leaving my journal behind for the benefit of anyone who is a criminal or at risk of becoming one. I have between 80,000 to 100,000 years left. I do not feel remorse, but I do wish I knew then what I know now. This is simply a warning. 100,000 years on a concrete slab. A hard, unforgiving surface. A hundred thousand years with one hour a day in a dying earthscape, which I barely recognize. One hundred thousand years of sickly green floors and cold steel doors that move for nothing. One hundred thousand years of mopping floors or scrubbing toilets. One hundred thousand years of being monitored by beings I cannot fully comprehend as their burning horror erupts in the back of my mind. A thousand and one life sentences. A thousand to go. Only one small thing gives me comfort. With a thousand life sentences, at least it's a nice clean number. I hope I don't die too soon and ruin this nice, even lifetime. 
because the next one will be hell. His suffering will go on and on, something tells me. And I certainly like the sound of that. It seems he gave his victims something that he will not have the luxury to experience. The mercy <laughs> of one lifetime. <laughs> But before we leave you, we have an alert regarding the Simply Scary podcast. Beginning with our season premiere, the Simply Scary podcast will be moving to Wednesday releases. Episode 1 of Season 2 will post on January 11th, 2017, on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel and our website, We will also be offering our patrons an extended premium version of the show, featuring more stories without those pesky ads. Wednesday releases will see us temporarily paring down our Simply Scary podcast episode production to one release a week until we can raise enough revenue to restart our twice-weekly episodes. Also, be aware that our YouTube freemium versions of the show will be approximately 30 minutes to make our broadcast more shareable for you viewers on YouTube. We do apologize for these major changes to our schedule, but necessity and a certain sentiment of an old British scientist, you may know him, Darwin, requires that we must adapt or become extinct. We appreciate your patronage here on YouTube and on iTunes as well, and the support of many of you becoming patrons. So, we are offering the opportunity to bring our paying customers the best we can offer, while still providing the free content you have come to love from the Simply Scary Podcast and Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. We appreciate your understanding of this matter and look forward to your support to help us resume our regular schedule and once again, frightening you to the very core of your rotten being. Also, it is extremely important that if you cannot or will not support us monetarily, we insist that you allow the ads to play through in our videos here on YouTube and occasionally click on them to assert your viewership. This is a very easy way for you to lend your support without opening your wallet. If you are ready to help turn off the lights and turn on the dark with your monetary support, become a patron after this mini-episode and you will be funding independent entertainment that mm, devours the competition. Go to simplyscarypodcast.com and click on Patrons at the top of the page to take the tour and to get first access to all our full content and unreleased material that you will find (laughs) nowhere else. Our final update is regarding our giveaways at the end of the Simply Scary Podcast's regular episodes. We will be transitioning from choosing iTunes reviews to choosing winners from comments left on our YouTube videos of the latest episodes of the Simply Scary Podcast. So make sure to take the time after listening to the show to comment about your experience. Tell us what you think or just plain show your love. Constructive comments will be chosen randomly to receive a special gift from us at the Simply Scary Podcast and Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. I am GM Danielson, thanking you for joining us for this special mini-episode. We will see you next time when we show you there is nothing simple about being scared. Unless, of course... It is the Simply Scary Podcast. <laughs>